I'm two miles up on the roof of the world. Polaxed by altitude sickness and preparing to go scuba diving. I'm following in Jack Cousteau's bubbles, hunting for a weird creature that, unlike me, is perfectly adapted to life at this altitude. The giant, saggy-skinned frog of Lake Titicaca. The Natural History Museum, London. My second home as a child. It was here that I fell in love with the diverse and bizarre world of animals which we share the planet with. Now, my visits are a starting point to breathe life into the dried bones and pickled skins of some of the planet's weird creatures. The Natural History Museum is a treasure trove of oddity. But no matter what else these creatures did when they were alive, they all breathed. Now, millions of years ago, life on this planet evolved first to breathe underwater. But then, a lot of creatures moved onto land, and they had to evolve to breathe there instead. Now, some animals have retained the ability to breathe in the water and out of it. They are the amphibians, and the animal I'm after is among them. Richard Lane, science director here at the Natural History Museum, has over 80,000 amphibians under his care, including a 230 million year old ancient cousin of my target creature. So this is an amphibian. I must have walked past this thing hundreds of times in the past and always assumed it was some kind of crocodilian, some kind of crocodile. It's amazing, isn't it? And incredible is the size of it. It's one hell of a newt. <laughs> <laughs> it's a giant ancestor of today's amphibians. So, I mean, by amphibian, we, we nowadays refer to the frogs, the salamanders, the newts, that sort of thing. And one of the important things about amphibians um, is that they're able to breathe through their skins. By breathing through their skins when underwater and then through their lungs when on land, amphibians are incredibly adaptable and are found on every continent except Antarctica. My target weird amphibian lives in a particularly difficult place near the roof of the world, 13,000 feet up in Lake Titicaca. Here, the air is thin and oxygen is very hard to come by. It's a bizarre giant frog cared for here at the museum by Barry Clark. What else have we got here in sort of Barry's frog shop? Well, over here, we've got possibly the weirdest of them all, which is the target species you're looking at. And this is the Lake Titicaca frog, the saggy skin <laughs> frog. Just seeing them in, the, in this jar, you get straight away the essence of these animals. They look totally different. I mean, run through sort of the specialised adaptations these animals have for their life at the roof of the world. They have a very saggy skin, which is the first thing. So it's got a greater surface for absorbing oxygen from the water. Um, which is a really good adaptation. It copes with the sort of uh, low amount of uh, oxygen in the water through its blood chemistry and through its behaviour of bobbing up and down uh, <laughs> to increase the sort of the flow of water around it so it can, it can sort of get extra oxygen and uh, absorb that through the skin. So pretty much everything about this frog is geared towards that high altitude life? Very highly adapted, yeah. One very famous expedition to Lake Titicaca, which I guess we're kind of following the footsteps of, was Jacques Cousteau. Now, he recorded allegedly vast, you know, large numbers of these frogs, but also of huge size. Are these yes. kind of representative of the sort of size we can find, or do they get bigger? Cousteau said they went up to sort of two feet, and, but he was including not just the head and body, but that's, the legs as right, well, so they stretch frog, stretched yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they do go that large, but reputedly uh, the numbers are going down and so is the size these days. So it's, it's more of a rarity to find a frog of the size that Cousteau encountered. So it could be a bit of a race against time for me, this one. To see one of these would be a dream come true for me, but it would be interesting to see also if we can find any clues as to, yeah, to see the big ones or even the clues to its uh, population. But that is my mission.
Now, I'm a long way from London, seven and a half thousand miles to be precise, but it's not the distance that's important here, it's the altitude. I'm something like two miles up here in the Bolivian Andes. Now, at this height, the air is so thin that just walking around the camera is exhausting, so I may well be on a bit of a go slow. But the reason I've come all this way is to find a very special animal indeed, and it lives right there in Lake Titicaca. Lake Titicaca, even as far as lakes go, is absolutely massive. 118 miles long, by 50 miles wide, and up to a thousand feet deep. And that is seriously deep. Jacques Cousteau reported giant two foot long saggy skinned frogs here 40 years ago, and we're following in his footsteps. Uh, it's great. I mean, I've frogged all around the world. I've looked for frogs everywhere. I consider myself a bit of a master frogger, even if I say so myself. However, this frog is different. It is a fully aquatic frog. It means it never comes to the surface. Um, so normally you'd just bumble around in the reeds and you'd see frogs sitting on the surface among the water vegetation. Not this frog. This frog will be down somewhere near the bottom. So that's where our challenge lies. But that's not the only problem. Altitude sickness is hitting us really hard. We're at about uh, 3,800 metres as well. So uh, effort is very hard. Everything's quite hard. In fact, all the crew are feeling uh, decidedly sluggish. We've all got thumping headaches. Um, every time you bend down to do your shoelaces up, you feel like passing out. By some cruel twist of fate, the only person who doesn't feel like this is our director but um, we're getting back somehow over the next week, I'm sure. Um, the first uh, impressions, though, is, is this is a very, very rich lake. I mean, the water is crystal clear, and just bumbling along the edges of these uh, reed beds, we can see into the water, we can see woo, um, an awful lot of plant life. It's a great place. <laughs> just hope we all perk up a bit, that's all. We're not alone feeling awful, though. Even Cousteau felt sick here. Writing in his log... Personally, I have suffered a great deal from the altitude. The relief I get while diving seems only to make me more sensitive to the discomfort of moving on land. Sometimes I find it impossible to make the slightest effort. At night, as soon as I fall asleep, I can no longer breathe, and the sense of asphyxiation wakes me up. Now, I haven't felt quite that bad, but our cameraman has. <laughs> He's been suffering the last couple of nights. He keeps thinking he's about to take his last breath. In fact, we're all feeling so ill, we're forced to abandon our first frog hunt and retreat back to the hotel. But even that's all about altitude sickness too. It gleefully points out that it has the highest elevator in the world and has oxygen on standby in the lobby. We all go to bed early, wondering why it's making us feel so ill. Something Richard Lane, the museum's director of science, knows all about. When people travel to high altitudes for the first time, they can suffer from a condition known as altitude sickness. This is because at an altitude of, say, 13,000 feet, there's 40% less oxygen available for you to breathe. This means it's very difficult to move around and actually very difficult to think. Also, a rather unpleasant side effect is the small blood vessels uh, in our bodies actually begin to ooze liquid, so the lungs begin to fill up. Fortunately, if you're there long enough, you can actually begin to adapt to the high altitude, but it does take some time. It's day two, the frogs are just there, but we're still desperately trying to overcome the feelings of altitude sickness. It's beautiful, but the problem with this place is, and as I said yesterday, and I'll probably say for the rest of this programme, even raising your head to appreciate the landscape and what a beautiful place it is, is exhausting.
Right, well, we've arrived at um, a little sort of a shallow area between two islands. And uh, it is very shallow. It's beautiful, though. Looking down into this crystal clear water, all I can see is this, this blanket of weed. And uh, when you've got your weed, you have your fish and your insects. And when you've got your fish and your insects, you've got the bigger things that eat those, um, which, with any luck, include our frog. So how are we going to get a good look at these frogs? Bearing in mind they live like no other frog on Earth, pretty much. Well, we have been lent a Master Frog Catcher's frog net. And are you ready for this? This is, it's kind of like a steam locomotive of the net world. It is a no-nonsense classic. It is made of iron. Oh, nearly went through the bottom of the boat. <laughs> and there's no way even Baker is going to break that. Look at that for a net. That is the most <laughs> beautiful, overly engineered net I've ever seen. But hopefully with this, we're going to, uh, if we see one, have a go at catching one and uh, at least bring it to the surface. As well as my insanely heavy iron net, we're using another secret weapon. Don Ramon, a local Aymara Indian. It was he who helped Cousteau find his frogs all those years ago. It doesn't matter how big your frog is, if it's sitting on that weed or it's even peeking out from underneath it, it's going to be very difficult to see. Um, and if this frog is like any other frog that I've ever spent time trying to catch, then as soon as it gets anywhere near... Um, on the other side. Can we go back this way a little bit? Oh, whoops, there. Did you see it as well? Yeah. It looked like it was upside down. It did. Oh. Oh. No, I can't. It's, it's too, it's, this is too difficult boat to work out. At this altitude, two miles up, diving is incredibly difficult and to be avoided if at all possible. There is, there is. Oh, so difficult in this <laughs> Just the effort to wield a net, even a very light carbon fibre monocoque precision made designer net would be a task under these conditions, but a great big cast iron one has left me gasping for breath. No, I don't think I've got anything there. I don't think that was a live frog. But uh, if I can't catch a dead frog, <laughs> it's not looking good, is it? OK, carry on drifting. Oh, he's good. He's good. Years and years down the duck pond. Wasn't wasted. <sighs> oh, God. Oh, he's freezing. Oh, my goodness me. You just catch me breath. <laughs> <sighs> this is a baby Lake Titicaca giant frog. This is a frog I have waited a long, 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 long time to be close to. Um, it's not an adult frog, and when they get, and um, when, when they are adult, they they do justify that uh, the uh, the title of being giant. Um, and also, they look totally different. So an adult frog really is going to be a big surprise if we catch one. But as far as uh, this is concerned, this is as good as I was hoping for today. We have actually found the frog I've come with to see. Look how inactive it is. Uh, this is partly down to the fact that uh, it's a frog out of water. Um, most frogs are semi-aquatic, which means they can move about on land very well and also do a bit of... <laughs> so I'm so so. Oh, my brain is so fuddled. Take two. Unlike other frogs, the frogs you might have in your own back garden, which are what you call semi-aquatic, this guy lives totally in the water throughout his entire life. Therefore, it doesn't have to jump. Um, partly, uh, the water supports its weight, and um, it has one of the slowest metabolisms of any amphibious animal. Um, I think there's one salamander that's a bit slower. So. All these are probably adaptations to this uh, life in this cold lake at uh, these uh, altitudes. Cool net, cool lake, cool frog. <laughs> only thing that's not right is we're all feeling like we've only just got up. Only found in this lake, the frogs, the lake and the people of Titicaca have been bound together for centuries. 
The Incas, who ruled this lake 500 years ago, revered the frogs, using them extensively in their medicines. Frog meat was a surefire cure for tuberculosis, whilst frog blood did wonders for sunstroke. The Incas used use frogs to bring rain, trapping them in pots, hoping the rain gods would hear their cries and fill the pots with rainwater. So they overflowed and released them. Now, um, I'm trying to understand Lake Titicaca a little bit because that's the way I'm going to stand some chance of understanding the frogs themselves. And at the moment, it's a little bit mysterious. Something I've noticed since being here is an abundance of this stuff. And this is Totora. It's actually a kind of rush. And uh, if I break it open, you can see inside it's really spongy. Lots of little air pockets in there, which means if I throw this on the water, it floats. Now, this is a quality that's not been wasted on the local people who have utilised that buoyancy to create these craft. This is a traditional balsa. And I have to say, it's actually a remarkably stable craft. The only thing I have to complain about is I'm getting terrible cramp on my legs. Now, this plant is one, it's really important for our frogs and a lot of the wildlife here because it creates a sort of fringe of shelter all the way around the lake. But the local people don't just use it to create raft like this, they actually eat it as well. They actually eat the roots and the tubers of it. It really is a remarkable plant and it can grow pretty tall as well. Some plants have been known to grow to over six meters in height. Oh, the cramps you get in these craft are quite something. Although I've seen some local blue people in these uh, bolsters and they don't do this. So either they've got better circulation than me or there's a technique to it that I haven't quite mastered. Ooh. All I can hear at the moment is all these squawking, grunting, chirping, flapping, squabbling and ticking. It's telling me that inside this stand of Totora is loads of life. There's loads of birds in there, but the big frustration is Totora grows so dense, seeing through it is impossible. Punatio, right in front of us. Lovely, lovely smart ducks though, with that lovely sort of dark black cap and that blue beak. Oh, look at that. Moves like a wren, lives in the rushes, the wren-like rush bird. Perfect name. I can hear him making a ticking noise. It sounds just like someone running their thumbnail across the teeth of a plastic cone like that. A night heron flying over us right now as well. I find this place so utterly beautiful, but as the sun sinks into the lake and turns the sky the colour of blood, doesn't half bring to mind the thousands of human sacrifices made to it by the Incas right here half a millennia ago. Dawn and we're back out on the lake trying to get closer to the frogs. The only way to see what a frog gets up to under the water is to become a frogman, of course. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm putting plenty on because this water is freezing. In fact, something that probably isn't coming across very well on the camera right now is that actually the air temperature is pretty cool as well. Despite this lovely clear sky and the sun shining, it's not warm at all. <laughs> it's hard work enough at sea level when you're fit It's like wrestling, I'm like wrestling myself here. I don't know if I'm out of breath because my wetsuit's too tight. Oh, well, it really is. The altitude. Okay. 
altitude sickness is when your caravan's got to help you get dressed. And even he struggles too. This is like going swimming in December in Edinburgh. <laughs> uh, you know that uh, very intense, painful headache you get when you eat ice cream too quickly? Well, it's what I've got right now. As yet, no frogs. It is incredibly dense though. There's a really thick layer of weed. Um, remarkably, there's not an awful lot of sign of life at all. I have to say, it's exquisitely beautiful down here. Really, really, really lovely. But I think this film is going to be turning into a bit of a, a mystery of the lake because there's not an awful lot of life in evidence. And uh, I just found a dead fish. So there's something here, but it just doesn't seem to uh, be a huge amount. Uh, so I'm sort of now wondering how this whole ecosystem works. It's quite an interesting place, but uh, yeah, there's people that fish here for a living, so there must be fish here somewhere. But uh, as for frogs, I haven't seen any more yet. Then, frogs at last. But they're dead. I have seen about five dead ones. Now, it's lots of questions, that's for sure. Oh, in the meantime, I'll get out because I'm freezing. One answer to the frog deaths could lie with the sun itself, the very same thing the Incas used to worship with their human sacrifices. Now, the sun gives out three forms of ultraviolet light, A, B and C. The very harmful B form increases with altitude. And amphibians, with their moist, unprotected skins, are very susceptible to damage by it. By hiding all the time underwater, the saggy skin frog keeps its exposure to a minimum. But if ultraviolet levels are rising, due to a thinning of the ozone layer, shallow water like this will offer less and less protection. However, ultraviolet light isn't the only danger the frogs face. This place is the Witch's Market in downtown La Paz, Bolivia's capital city. Like the Natural History Museum, it's full of preserved animals. But that is where the similarity ends. The specimens here are all on sale for folk remedies and offerings to the earth goddess Pachamama. These are a dried local dried frogs, um, actually toads these are, these little bufo toads. Um, you'd put these in your room um, they've got their mouth open and you give them offerings of smoke and tobacco and that again would bring you good financial luck so if you're starting up a business perhaps or you're having a bit of a bad year with the tax man get one of these stick it in the corner stick it on your mantelpiece and your your, your quids in quite literally there's also other things here which um as from a biological point of view are kind of interesting we've got a, um, a jungle cat of some kind here I can't work out that's a margi or an ocelot um it's very hard to recognize it as any species right now it's missing various limbs and that, because those are also given as offerings. Um, down here we've got another character I'd love to see alive up here. These are the, uh, the mountain hairy armadillos, actually becoming very rare now. It's actually a really rare experience, this, that you can still get this sort of stuff in a kind of a non-touristy manner. This isn't touristy, this is for real. These beliefs are amazingly continuations of those that the Incas were practicing all those centuries ago. It's kind of shocking, but at the same time quite fascinating as well, that, that people really live and believe this stuff. But folk medicines are not the only modern uses for frogs. Something else has a far bigger impact on their numbers. There are fishermen out on the lake, lots of them. And they're not just after the 23 species of high-altitude fish unique to Titicaca. It's a big net, isn't it? Yeah. 
Pickery. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually beginning to learn some things here now. Right, this one here is uh, one of the introduced species from the lowlands of Argentina and it's adapted really well to the conditions of Lake Titicaca. Um, and this is, uh, they call it kingfish or um, pejere, um, I believe is the pronunciation of this fish here by the locals. And uh, it is one of the introduced species that is potentially causing a lot of damage to the uh, lake ecosystem by preying on um, the eggs and smaller fry of the native species. But the problem is this, it's so much better to eat, so the locals prefer this to the local fish. That's the way it goes. But kingfish aren't the only things in the lake people eat a lot of. Well, we just caught a frog. Um, they obviously do get caught in nets then. And it is Culius, one of the Lake Titicaca saggy skinned frogs. But it's that yellow bellied one again, just like the one we had when we were snorkeling. Having said that, it's also much saggier looking than the ones we were catching. So, uh, interestingly, he didn't throw it straight back. Whether that's because he knows we're interested in frogs or whether he's got a, um, a potential market for this little chap, who knows? Very interesting. They obviously do catch them. According to Cousteau's old guide, Don Ramon, fishing accounts for over 15,000 frogs a year being taken from the lake to supply restaurants. This, together with rising UV and pollution levels, might begin to explain why we've only seen a few small frogs and no sign of the large ones at all. So to find the really big frogs, I'm going to leave these waters, where the frogs are particularly vulnerable to fishermen, and head 35 miles across the lake to where Don Ramon once took Jacques Cousteau. And not to be outdone by the Frenchman, that means going scuba diving which is particularly difficult at this altitude. Here in Lake Titicaca, there are no dive resorts. So the downside is we've had to bring our own dive resort with us. And uh, we've got all, also got our own hydrofoil as well, which we're gonna load up with all our kits, um, which uh, if you look behind you is um, quite considerable. <laughs> all for a frog, that is. High-tech hydrofoils have replaced traditional reed boats as the main means of travel on the lake, as they can cope with incredibly rough water and are extremely fast, which is handy when you're crossing a lake over 100 miles long. And particularly handy for us, as with no ambulances or helicopters here, we need something very fast to get us back across the lake to a hospital if something goes wrong with our dives. Now, usually these hydrofoils are designed to take tourists across the lake. They're not used to a load of quite as big as we've got. In fact, our load is so heavy <laughs> that the guys are having to uh, transfer all the weight to the back because we can't even get up on the hydrofoils at the moment, which is the whole point of these boats. At present, we're crawling along at a speed that's not much greater than the little outboard engine we had yesterday. Belching black smoke, we crawl across Lake Titicaca. Carrying with us, Don Ramon. Our switched on and alert dive team. And observers from the Bolivian Navy. They're on board to ensure we don't steal any Inca gold from the lake's depths. Finally, appearing over the bowels of our asthmatic hydrofoil is our destination, Isla del Sol, the island of the sun. It's the place where Don Ramon brought Cousteau all those years ago to find his giant frogs, and the island at the centre of the Inca religion. For them, the entire island was sacred, believing the sun itself was born here from a rock near the summit. Now that was a silly idea. We thought we'd just come to the top of the hill here um, on Isla del Sol in order to get an idea of the scale of Lake Titicaca. I think it was worth it because I think we've proved a point. That there, that view that looks like the Mediterranean, is actually Lake Titicaca. 
Now we've come here obviously to find a bigger frog, but just because it's bigger doesn't mean it's going to be any easier to locate a Pedro. Come on, let's go and find a nice, nice spot to sit. Come on Pedro, don't mess me around now. Well it's quite a good little moment to sort of uh, reflect on what we're actually going to be trying to achieve tomorrow, which is uh, um, a first for me, I've never had to dive for frogs. Um, and also for me, it's the first time I've ever dived at altitude, which actually, which actually brings with it a whole bunch of other physiological problems for me, the diver. So, um, you know, I'm a little, little anxious because it's, uh, it is quite a stressful thing to do on the body. Um, and that there, Isla de Luna, is probably going to be our first dive site. We've had a tip off that's a good place for reasonably large frogs. Diving at altitude is particularly dangerous, partly because it increases your chances of getting the bends. The bends happen during or after a dive when nitrogen bubbles form in your tissues and in your brain. And in the worst cases, it's fatal. So if something does go wrong with our dive, I just hope they fix that hydrofoil. No, 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 <laughs> no, Pedro, no. <laughs> Isla de la Luna and Don Ramon's pinpointed the dive site. Well, we're just getting kitted up. We're all uh, about to uh, go in. This is what happens when, uh, as soon as you have to start filming underwater, it gets a lot more complicated. So uh, we have uh, uh, Carlos at the end there, who is the underwater cameraman. We have uh, Zoma, who's my, uh, our underwater supervisor and buddy. And uh, Luis, who's the uh, above uh, surface dive supervisor. Um, and uh, yeah, I have never ever done frogging like this. You see, frogging for me usually is a solitary activity, which involves me going out on my own, rather sadly, because no one really likes to join me. Uh, with my own little head torch and, uh, and a net and a camera, and that's pretty much it. But this is more effort than I've ever put into one single frog in my life. So we're just about to get, get ready. We're going to go in um, and have a little look around the edge of the island here. Well, as is always the way with diving anywhere that um, is not a, a recognised dive site, but is also somewhere where fishermen make a living, it's always a good idea to take a knife down with us, um, just in case we get, uh, well, get caught up really. Now, this is Jacques Cousteau's time here. Not many people have died Lake Titicaca. So this is a really special opportunity for me. Okay, let's find frogs. There are so many particles in the water, visibility is terrible. It's really hard to see your hand in front of your face, yet alone a well camouflaged frog. But out of the gloom, suddenly I begin to find frogs in fairly large numbers. We've got one here, it's only a little one though. They're not Cousteau's two footers, but they're not babies either. That's kind of the next size up. The one we had the other day was only this big. This one's a little bit larger. And already you can see these great big flaps of skin all around the top of its body there. You can see them wobbling away. Now, when Garmin and Agassi, the first two people to describe this frog to science, when they saw it, they described it using a Latin name. Telmatobius coolius, which means a chromatic testicle. That of course refers to this really baggy, saggy skin that looks like several sizes too big for the body. There's loads of them down here, but they're all quite small. I'm a bit surprised by that. 
but they're definitely the right species. They may be males, in which case the females are still to be found because they're much bigger. Female frogs, when they're adult, are nearly always bigger than the males, simply because when it comes to breeding, they need to be able to accommodate frog spawn inside themselves. So, for a really big frog, it's a female we need. But that'll have to wait for the next dive, as with air running out, we've got to return to the surface. Five metres. We saw more frog snuck checkers to get. I think I've still got a couple on me. Don Ramon's delivered again. Definitely different to the ones we saw the other day. Much baggier and saggier. Oh, I better get out of the boat because I'm, I'm knackered. After all the excitement of getting out of the boat, I forgot I'd actually, uh, I'd actually put a couple of frogs in my pocket. <laughs> And uh, fortunately, they survived the ascent very well. But uh, they're very different to the ones we saw the other day. That's, that's the, the most striking thing. They're very mottled. They look like they're carved out of granite. And much baggier as well. Even though they're just a little bit bigger, they've got a lot more loose skin on them. They're still pretty small, though. Hopefully, if the visibility improves down there, we'll be able to track down a massive female like the ones Cousteau saw. But right now, the visibility is absolutely awful. While we wait for better conditions and the water to clear, I'm heading for a tiny Inca island to hunt for creatures on the surface. It's where the Inca medicine men used to come to catch their living ingredients. So this is the island just off Isla del Sol, which is uh, known locally as uh, Chiyika. They also call it Isla La Serpiente. Now you don't need to speak an awful lot of Spanish to realise that uh, that means it's the island of the snakes. Okay, well I have an inherent suspicion of any location named after an animal where it's supposed to be a good place to find that particular animal. Um, and this is uh, no exception. <laughs> Usually it just raises one's hopes to a, an, an unnatural level, only to have them dashed again when you realise that having serpent navigated the island several times, you haven't found a single snake. But uh, we're going to have a go. Trachymenis peruvianis, come out wherever you are. This looks like an old Inca terrace. Oh, wood lice everywhere. Some more wood lice. I'm going to rename it Ela Lowell Woodlouse. It's the only thing I've found so far. I reckon all the shamans, aren't they? They've all taken them. <laughs> There's none left. They thought, oh, everyone's gone, right? Ela de Serpiente, that's the place to find snakes. We'll go there then. And uh, it's a case of overshopped, I expect. Out of stock. Right, well, okay, let's go and find something really exciting, like a, um, I don't know, millipede or something. <laughs> 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 a millipede. <laughs> well, what's this? It's not a snake. It's a bit of a surprise, actually, all the way up here. It's uh, a little tarantula of some kind. Didn't know we had them up here. There they are. Only a little one. I wonder what it is. Got no idea if it's even got a name. May not even be known to science. It's the only thing of any uh, substantial size that we found on this island so far. Um, pretty much doing, I'd imagine, what the snakes would be doing as well, which is hunkered down underneath an object in a burrow somewhere, just probably sitting out to the dry season up here in the Andes. In the wet season, uh, this place should, I imagine, be crawling. But. We did get this little guy. It's very, very lovely. Very unusual looking uh, little spider. No doubt this animal gets very fat on wood lice. So, no snakes on Snake Island. No surprises there. But the sun's coming out over the island of the sun. Which means better visibility for our diving. Now, we are kind of running out of dive time, unfortunately. Um, 
Uh, and we found some frogs this morning at the other site and they were, they were the right species but they weren't quite the one that says it all really. I'm after a nice large specimen to justify that title of the giant Titicaca frog. And uh, they do exist and uh, um, the boys have had a little recce around here. We reckon this point's a good one. They've seen a couple of them in quite reasonably deep water so uh, we're going to go after those now and see if we get lucky. As we enter the water, it's obvious the visibility is a little bit better, and beneath me I can clearly see the prize I've travelled so far to find. We've got a big female here, look at this! <laughs> Have you ever seen anything quite like it? Now this here is the frog we've been looking for. The giant Titicaca frog. I'm so happy that we have finally, finally found this amazing and unique animal. They still get a lot bigger than this, but this one is demonstrating very well why they've got that other name, the saggy skinned frog. If you had a physique like that, you'd be embarrassed to go straight down the gym. But for this animal, geez, that is the design. That's what makes these animals so unique. Now, because it has such tiny lungs, a third the size of those of other similar sized frogs, it has to breathe in another way. And that's exactly where all those folds and flappy flaps and bingo wings come in. These flaps of skin are rich in blood vessels and they give him a really large surface area to absorb oxygen from the water. And he uses his skin just like a kind of gill. And that is the perfect adaptation for living at this altitude. Oxygen is more readily available down here and the frogs can make the most of it. That is a very, very beautiful amphibian. I mean, just look at the expression on that face. You've got to love it. It's so ugly, it's beautiful. Every single one of them that we've caught so far has been totally different in its colorations and markings. Another thing that makes them very, very special to me, I think they are stunning. And when you see them against the weedy bottom or on the, on the sort of the rocks around here, you can see why that sort of mottled coloration comes in quite handy. As I say that, there's not a huge number of predators for these animals in this lake. Oh yes! Gotcha. Now we were just doing our little rest stop as you do as a diver. And uh, look who swam past! The biggest frog of the lot! It's absolutely stunning! All those things I said earlier on, they apply to this one ten times over. Look at that bizarre mantle of skin. That has to be one of the weirdest things you could ever imagine, huh? Now, you may not ever have seen these things on TV before, not unless you can remember Jacques Cousteau's first expedition here in 1973. There's a good reason for that. This has to be the hardest worked for frog in the world. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It's horrible being on the surface. Down there, it's lovely. On the top here, it's hard work. But the good news is, we got some cracking frogs. Really, really beautiful. I love it when a story develops like that naturally. It's like we had a few little, little ones, and then it got a bit bigger. And then we we're just at a safety stop, really shallow, just sort of sitting there for a couple of minutes to let all the nasty gases out. And uh, this great big mother of a frog swam right past us. 
and uh, we've got her with her with her son. She's she only put it somewhere. And she says it all. Other than that pretty charismatic uh, expression that this frog wears, the thing that sets it apart from all other frogs that I have ever met is this peculiar, flabby, baggy, oversized skin. I mean, just look at it. I mean, you can see it in the water when I was down there, but on the surface, <laughs> it rucks right up. If I just roll about and forth gently like that, you'll see what I mean. Look at that. Great big folds of skin just fall down over her eyes. Cousteau reported frogs over two feet long when stretched out and weighing over two pounds. Now this one's probably only about half of that, but at roughly a pound in weight, it's still 20 times bigger than your average garden frog back home, which is pretty huge. Sadly, it's very possible that Cousteau's monsters simply don't exist here anymore. Don Ramon no longer sees them and blames the fishermen. But other more sinister factors like rising UV and pollution levels could very well be playing their part too. So my frogs are probably actually about as big as they get nowadays and likely to become an even rarer sight. And that is the story of what has to be the frog I've worked the hardest to meet. Very happy with that.